we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for joining this evening um, for this Maven Outreach webinar. Uh, my name is Tom Mason. I'm the manager for outreach and communications at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, or LASP, at the University of Colorado. Um, I just want to let everyone know before we start that we will be recording this webinar and posting it online. I put the URL for the um, our webpage in the chat box. If you want to uh, check that out when this webinar is over, you're welcome to uh, go and uh, check out any of our previous webinars as well. And I'm very excited for this evening's talk. Uh, this is a topic of great interest to the entire Mars community and far beyond. Um, and I'd like to introduce you to our speaker for this webinar. Uh, Dr. Paul Mahaffey is the director of the Solar System Exploration Division at NASA Goddard, where he's involved in the study of planetary atmospheres and the development of space-qualified instrumentation. Paul's main research interests are planetary science, especially chemical and isotopic composition of planetary atmospheres and comets, advanced instrument development for organic and light isotope analysis and planetary targets, and analog studies for Martian and cometary materials, including both laboratory and field work. Paul is the principal investigator on the Sample Analysis at Mars, or SAM instrument suite, on the Curiosity Mars rover, uh, currently operating on the surface. He's also the lead scientist for the Neutral Gas and Ion Mass Spectrometer instrument on the MAVEN Mars Orbiter mission. Paul, I really appreciate you taking the time to be here this evening. And as I said, I really look forward to hearing this presentation. I'm going to turn it over to you to share. Your okay, great. Glad to be here. Uh, let me try sharing my screen here. Looks good. I think you just have to hit your presentation mode and you're all set. Yep. Okay, all look good from your end? Okay, great. Yes. Uh, and uh, you can hear me loud and clear, Tom? Sounds good, Paul. Okay, I'm, I'm never very, uh, very quiet here. So uh, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, glad to talk to you uh, a little bit about methane on Mars. Uh, this is a MAVEN webinar, but uh, we've actually been measuring methane, not only from telescopes uh, on Earth, and from orbit around Mars, but from the surface of Mars with the Curiosity rover uh, that you see there uh, in its selfie image uh, on the title slide here. So um, <clears throat> the Martian methane mystery, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, where it comes from, uh, uh, why on earth all the measurements don't agree exactly with each other, and uh, what its tie is to what's really a major NASA objective to look for uh, life outside of Earth, uh, potentially ultimately outside the solar system. And uh, Mars is a good place to uh, take a look for present or, or past life. So we'll talk a little bit about how methane uh, fits into uh, that picture. And of course, since we've been on Mars now with the Curiosity rover for uh, more than seven years, I. Uh, We'll give you a little bit of background to what we've been up to all this time. It's been a really uh, exciting journey. So a little bit less about MAVEN, uh, a little bit more about uh, what we're doing on the surface of Mars. Uh, and uh, and uh, start off with a little bit here of uh, kind of general perspective. Um, of course, a huge emerging area of work with uh, solar system and extrasolar system exploration is uh, understanding what's out there and the big telescopes. We actually had this big telescope, the James Webb Telescope in our labs at uh, NASA Goddard uh, for many years as it was being developed as these uh, mirror segments were being put together. And uh, it's just immense. I mean, it's just tremendous. You can uh, take a look at the, the people down in the right hand corner. And this is all in a big clean room assembly room at uh, NASA Goddard. And of course, it all started uh, way back in 1610, where with a really very much less powerful telescope, uh, Galileo uh, took a look up in the sky and actually made a really pretty good telescope and 
and basically found the four moons of Jupiter and concluded that, uh, you know, maybe the uh, him and others, uh, the, the Earth wasn't necessarily the center of the universe around which everything revolved uh, and so on. Uh, but, uh, you know, Galileo certainly didn't look for methane, but uh, big telescopes in the future will. Uh, for example, if you're looking for life on an exoplanet, let's say you find an exoplanet that looks something like Earth, that has an atmosphere, uh, and if you find both oxygen, for example, and methane together in the atmosphere in disequilibrium, uh, they shouldn't be there both together potentially uh, in a, a certain abundance uh, unless there's life. That could potentially be one uh, biosignature. And, and similarly on Mars, uh, next slide here. Um, <clears throat> Mars is getting increasingly interesting. On the left, we've, we've just found, uh, although the surface of Mars is, is really ancient, as, as many of you may know who've been following the MAVEN mission, the objective of that mission is really to understand how the atmosphere of Mars was lost. But even at the present time, we're finding more and more about Mars. And for example, last year it was reported that there was a subglacial lake uh, near the polar regions of Mars. And then really exciting targets within our solar system, uh, these icy moons, Europa and Enceladus, for example, two prime examples where the surface is covered with ice, but there's just a tremendous amount of water there uh, below that icy surface. For example, Europa has more than twice the water of all the Earth's oceans combined. And uh, wouldn't it be exciting if in those very aqueous environments where you have interfaces, you have a, a core, a mantle, and an interface with the ocean. In our own ocean, we find uh, essentially hot spots or plumes where life may develop and where methane is coming out. Uh, so these are good places as well to look for life, and uh, measurements of methane will tie to that story. And I'm going to get back to Mars soon, but uh, big objects in the solar system, for example, uh, Jupiter and Saturn and so on have uh, small amounts of methane in the atmosphere, but Saturn's moon Titan is just really rich in methane. It's mostly nitrogen, uh, but 5% methane in the atmosphere. And because of all the, um, essentially all the en energetic particles going into the atmosphere of Titan, uh, all sorts of chemistry happens in the atmosphere. And produces what is kind of this smog like this orange color to the atmosphere, these aerosols that are in the atmosphere, uh, really rich organic chemistry and really interesting news. The latest mission that NASA selected as part of the uh, New Frontier, basically billion dollar class uh, mission proposal was a mission called Dragonfly. And it's really apt name because what Dragonfly is gonna do is kind of parachute down into that atmosphere. And uh, it's, it's, it's essentially like a drone. It's going to get all these blades spinning even before it lands on the surface, try and gently land on the surface, and then make measurements, and then fly off to another spot and uh, make more measurements, and really try and find out more detail of what that uh, very chemically complex uh, environment is. It's really cold up there. For example, on the bottom left, you see these uh, lakes. Those lakes are mostly liquid methane. So it rains methane. Instead of raining water on the atmosphere of Titan, it rains methane. And uh, so really many interesting places, even in our own solar system, uh, including Mars, where, where we can find methane. And it may be that reason that uh, people uh, when we make reports of methane on Mars, immediately jump to the conclusion, ah, that's life. But really, I think, you, you know, on Mars, for example, or Titan or one of these icy moons of, uh, of, uh, of Saturn or Jupiter, we'll really need more evidence than, than just methane, because as I'll show in a minute, methane has potentially both biotic and abiotic sources. And so what we really want is uh, signatures of organics, not just the simplest organic methane, uh, 
but uh, more complex organics. You'll see uh, some of them in, in this image. And as you get more and more complex to the right, there are probably only certain things like DNA that life can make. Can make. It would be extraordinarily improbable, for example, that an abiotic process, just radiation, let's say, and ultraviolet and, and chemistry alone uh, could produce something as complicated as, as DNA. Basically, life has to make that, has to put amino acids in the right order, has to make proteins. And, and so life basically uh, produces complex molecules. So both the simple and the complex molecules are what we're, we're looking for when we're, when we're going after life. Now, how life started in the first place, of course, is, is a big mystery. Lots of folks working on that. Did it start in, in, in a pond-like environment, for example, on Earth? Uh, did it start uh, deep under the ocean where there were thermal vents, uh, volcanic material coming up uh, into the ocean? Uh, and is Earth kind of the only place that, that it started? I mean, we have a, have a data point of one. Right now we know that uh, there's life on Earth all over the place. And, uh, and what's it like out there, really? Even in our own solar system or beyond, uh, is there life? And looking for methane is really, is really part of that story. Uh, not the whole story, but part of the story that we're going to talk about a little bit today. So methane in the Earth's atmosphere, uh, there's not a lot of methane, but methane is something to worry about because uh, the uh, methane in the Earth's atmosphere uh, produced by these, uh, the, the bar chart on the left, you can see where it comes from, landfills, for example, uh, coal mining, other sources such as some abiotic sources, uh, natural gas systems, but it turns out that most of the methane in the uh, Earth's atmosphere comes from uh, comes from biological sources. You know, cows. Uh, a little explanation on the right from Wikipedia: basically, having having being ruminant animals and having a rumen, basically two stomachs, uh, so they can digest all this uh, cellulose uh, enhanced uh, plants and grains that they eat. Uh, but in those, in those stomachs, basically, the microbes get to work, and the microbes uh, are methanogens. They generate methane as they do their work of basically breaking down uh, these materials for, for cows and, and other uh, animals, deer and camels and so on, to metabolize. And uh, uh, interestingly, a good portion of the methane that's in the in the Earth's atmosphere comes from those sources, which is why, as all these great debates of, uh, you know, what we're doing to our own climate and is, is global warming basically going to make parts of the, uh, of the planet that we live on a little bit more uninhabitable, uh, it turns out that cows are a big part of the picture. And so that's a reason for folks looking at alternatives to cows, uh, plant-based, uh, uh, burgers that taste good, for example, and, and that type of thing. And so, um, interestingly enough, something I learned when I Googled this is most of the uh, methane from cows doesn't come from their rear end, it comes from, from the cows belching it. So uh, anyway, lots of, lots of methane in our atmosphere. It can, of course, come from all, things like volcanoes as well. Uh, lots of carbon and so on beneath the, uh, deep beneath the crust of the earth and is volcanoes basically pop up. You can release a lot of smelly sulfur dioxide and other gases, but uh, also methane as well. So uh, what do we have on Mars? Well, we're finding methane, and we'll talk a little bit about the types of uh, discoveries that we've made, but we just don't know exactly where the methane on Mars is coming from. And uh, starting from the top, let's work our way down. We know that basically, when we have meteor streams and cosmic dust falling into, into a planet, when we see a meteor stream on Earth, we, you know, shooting stars, we see them uh, multiple times a year. Uh, they go through the very thin atmosphere on Mars and, and they do burn up a little bit, but a lot of that organic material makes its way down to the surface and ends up on the surface and potentially um, ultraviolet radiation could break it apart and produce some methane. So maybe some methane comes there. Uh, 
we've looked real hard at is there a correlation between spikes in methane that I'm going to talk about and the meteor streams. And we've concluded that we really haven't found any yet. We're, we're going to keep looking, but uh, apparently it's not coming from there. And on Earth, what we have is uh, essentially seeping up from the subsurface in various places. Um, some of you may have seen as you drill in the ocean, sometimes you, you pull up these clathrates, these methane hydrates. And they're so rich in methane that you can light a match to them and they start burning like crazy. And maybe on early Mars, a bunch of methane, wherever it came from, is uh, below the surface. Uh, it's stored there and seeping up. I think I'll hopefully convince you we have a little bit of evidence for that uh, as we go along here. But where did it come from originally when, when Mars was different, when Mars had a bunch of surface water, when Mars had a heavier atmosphere? Uh, it could have come from life. It could have come from methanogens, uh, potentially below the surface, uh, or it could be abiotic. It could come from reactions that we call serpentization, basically when volcanic type rocks, when olivine and so on, uh, interact with water. Uh, you can make hydrogen and methane just by totally abiotic processes. So we still don't know. It's a mystery. Um, but it all got very interesting even before uh, MAVEN, even before Curiosity, uh, when there were observations from terrestrial telescopes, which are really difficult, um, looking for methane uh, on Mars. It's difficult because from these telescopes, such as the one you see on the right from Mauna Kea, you have to go through the Earth's atmosphere, which has many, many more times methane, and see what's coming from Mars. So essentially, you have to rely on a Doppler shift, basically a shift in the position of the line uh, to, to observe methane. But nevertheless, uh, with very careful observations, the team at Goddard uh, and the team at Catholic University, the first two names uh, listed there, basically published reports of methane, basically 10 parts per billion or tens of parts per billion. Uh, and then it went away. It persisted for a few months in the case of uh, Mike Muma's observations and then uh, his colleague, Geronimo Villanova, uh, carried out many more observations. And they didn't see methane, but they basically set an upper limit of uh, seven parts per billion by volume. In other words, most of the gas on Mars is carbon dioxide, a bit of argon, a bit of nitrogen. Uh, but the methane abundance, uh, not even tens of parts per billion, but way down less than seven parts per billion, very trace amounts of methane. And then uh, there's an orbiter uh, uh, um, called Mars Express. And uh, they had basically, by averaging many, many spectra, uh, one report basically uh, looking at the polar region, they averaged 15,000 spectra, lots and lots of spectra, and saw a signal uh, that they thought was, again, very low amounts of methane, 15 parts per, per billion. The image you see on the bottom left is really uh, from uh, Mike Muma's observations uh, from the uh, observatory in Hawaii and uh, suggesting that methane was, was localized in, in those particular mid-latitude uh, areas. But immediately it caused controversy in, <laughs> in the scientific community. Uh, a couple of folks whose names are listed up top uh, immediately asked, well, if the lifetime that photochemistry predicts in the, in the Mars atmosphere for methane, the photochemical lifetime, which is much shorter on Earth, but at Mars it's very long because there's not as much radiation reaching the planet. If it's really 300 years, then how could a plume go away in just a few months? And uh, so you'd have to have a mechanism that we don't uh, know anything about uh, that would uh, be uh, making the methane go away. And then there were even questions with regard to the uh, measurement itself. For example, uh, Kevin Zonley uh, published a paper asking, was the terrestrial uh, methane properly accounted for? And if, uh, for example, the methane was going away by some chemical oxidation, there's not much oxygen in the atmosphere of Mars. It should have been depleted over, over tens of thousands of years. So what, what on Earth is going on? Well, maybe what on Mars is going on there? And so lots of uncertainty. 
And then we were hoping to, you know, really get a handle on this problem with the Curiosity rover uh, and uh, talk a little bit about uh, Curiosity. But basically, we have a very sensitive methane detect detector uh, on Curiosity in the experiment that I'm leading called SAM. You can see the arrow pointing to it in the bottom left. It's basically inside the rover. And we can measure methane either produced uh, either by sucking in some atmosphere or we also heat up samples that we drill. And as we heat them up, we can also look for methane. Of course, there are all sorts of other experiments on Curiosity, just you know, really well instrumented. There's a mineralogy experiment called Chemin. There are four cameras on uh, uh, for science cameras, basically, uh, and then many other cameras that help navigate and so on. Uh, there's a microscopic imager out on the arm and elemental measurement tools out on the arm uh, and a weather station on the mast and, and so on. So a really well-equipped rover, but for the purpose of this talk, we're going to focus a little bit on what we're doing with the sample analysis at Mars experiment and uh, our methane measurements. But I'll just giving you a bit question. of back. Yeah, go ahead. Excuse me. Uh, David is asking how, and this is if you know this, how will the 2020 rover improve on Curiosity's methane detection? Uh, unfortunately, uh, 2020 rover has no methane detector on it. And the best that it can do, it's basically focused very much on having some instruments that are trying to find image and basically do Raman spectroscopy and so on to find interesting samples to drill. But then it's not going to do what Curiosity does, put them into the interior of the rover, into an analytic lab and do chemistry. It's basically going to collect those samples and the idea is to bring them back to Earth. And you know, maybe by uh, mid 30s or so in another 15 years at the earliest, uh, we might have those samples back to Mars. There is an idea, well, let's also try and capture a bit of the atmosphere and bring it back. And so there will be an opportunity with the return samples uh, to, to bring a sample both of solids and of the atmosphere back to Earth. But it's, it's way down the road. So what we got now are orbiters on Mars looking for methane. We have uh, Curiosity on the surface still working great looking for methane, but nothing really on, on 2020. So it will not improve on our measurements because it has no equipment to do so. Thanks, Paul. So here's where Curiosity landed. It's uh, this 150 uh, kilometer diameter crater, a big old asteroid or comet came barreling in, you know, somewhere around 3.9 uh, billion years ago and formed this crater and uh, evacuated it. And it later filled up with, with sediment blown in potentially and and uh, got evacuated by winds later on. Uh, but since there were really interesting uh, signatures from space, from spectroscopy of, of hydrated minerals and so on, on the, on the walls of this central mound called Mount Sharp, uh, we decided to go there with Curiosity. And kind of the ellipsoidal circle you see down on the bottom is we wanted a safe place to land on the plains, not on the slopes of the mountains. And so that was the landing ellipse. And uh, so I'm going to uh, digress from methane just a little bit to tell you a little bit about what we found with the Curiosity rover, uh, the, what the mineralogy and geology are telling us, the isotopes, uh, something about the age of rock formation and how long those rocks have been exposed to uh, radiation from space, and then basically what uh, the mineralogy, the chemistry of the surface is, is telling us about whether this is really a habitable environment for, for past life or not. And uh, talk about more complex organics and then swing back to methane. And that's a, an interesting story. The experiment I used because I, I helped uh, propose it to NASA and, and helped build it is the sample analysis at Mars, SAM experiment. And it has both a mass spectrometer, and much of the results I'll talk about are from the mass spectrometer, or from this six column gas chromatograph you see on the bottom left, uh, or our methane detector, our best methane detector, uh, 
uh, is the TLS, this tunable laser spectrometer. And our colleagues at JPL uh, provided that, and then they delivered it to us at Goddard, and then we integrated it uh, into this SAM experiment, which is about the size of a microwave oven. You can see in the upper right where we've integrated it all, we're lowering it very carefully into the rover in this clean room. The rover's turned upside down and, and uh, is being lowered very gently in, into, the, uh, into the interior uh, of the rover. And what we have in addition to being able to just introduce atmosphere is we have these quartz cups where you could drop sample in and then put them in an oven and heat them up and see what gases come off. Uh, and then metal cups, which contain a, a liquid, a chemical agent, which I'll uh, talk a little bit about. So all in all, we have 74 cups uh, built by a really creative uh, engineering firm called Honeybee Robotics. And uh, this thing has just worked beautifully on Mars. Basically the idea is there are two rings of cups, you rotate around and then there's a, a motor that basically pushes a cup up into an oven and you, you heat it up and, and see what gases come off. So for example, the, the experiments we do are illustrated uh, in this slide. Uh, when we're heating a sample up, on the bottom you'll see the temperature of the sample is increasing. Uh, we go all the way up to uh, uh, 900 degrees centigrade, for example. And then we follow the signal of various gases that are released as these gases are, re are coming off the sample. And then what you do, you can see up on the top, basically some of that gas we trap. And then once we're finished trapping it, we inject it into a gas chromatograph. And some of you, if you've uh, taken chemistry labs, may have used an experiment like this. Uh, basically, you introduce a pulse of gas by thermally releasing it from the trap into this 30 meter capillary column. And then the gases get separated in there. They come out in time into the, back into the mass spectrometer. And so the signal you see on the bottom right is what we call a chromatogram. It's basically the different gases being retained and being released at different times in, into the mass spectrometer. And that process can take uh, approximately 20 minutes or half an hour. And, and we get our signals of, of gases coming off. Uh, what we do in the tunable laser spectrometer is a little bit different. We basically have a laser and two mirrors uh, bouncing light back and forth between these two mirrors. So for example, in this uh, tunable laser spectrometer, which is only a few centimeters long, uh, less, than a, less than a couple feet long, uh, you basically can bounce light back and forth enough times that you get a 16 meter path length. So it makes it very, very sensitive. And then methane uh, reacting to this infrared radiation uh, will absorb. And so the principal investigator of this uh, instrument, Chris Webster at Jet Propulsion Lab, basically picked a laser that selected some lines out of this very, very rich absorption line spectra you see on the left. And both is detecting methane uh, in red. These are particular uh, rotational vibration lines of methane and uh, deuterated methane in, in blue and another isotope of carbon uh, in green. And so you see we could get isotopes of, of methane if we have enough of it uh, with the tunable laser spectrometer. Uh, so we landed on Mars. Uh, this is a, a high-rise image of uh, overlaid with the, uh, with the basically path of curiosity. We've now traversed more than, uh, more than 22 kilometers. We're up in the, in the mound of Gale Crater and increasingly going, going higher and higher. But as we went along this traverse, we would be basically drilling holes, taking samples, and also sampling the atmosphere uh, every so often. Here you see various drill holes there. The litter of a nickel and just a few centimeters deep, very shallow. And it's really interesting. Look at all the different colors. Isn't, isn't that interesting? Um, you can see that, you know, overall on the surface, Mars might look pretty red from all this rusty like uh, oxidized iron containing compounds from dust that blows all over the place. But John Klein was the very first sample that we drilled. You see that 
in the upper left there, and immediately it looks gray. And that's kind of an indicator of clays. And when we went into the details of the chemistry, the mineralogy, uh, we found it was indeed clay. So I'm going to talk about that uh, just a little bit going forward here. This is from the mineralogy experiment. It's an x-ray diffraction where a little bit of that material that we drilled uh, got put into a cell and basically uh, an x-ray beam got beamed through the cell and that uniquely identifies some of the minerals that are there. And so these are color coded. For example, the green are these clays just from the, the peaks that show up in this x-ray diffraction uh, image as the x-ray light gets diffracted by the, by the different crystal structure of these, of these minerals. And so it's really interesting as we, as we go up slope, you can see at the bottom left, that's where we started. Uh, the second drill hole there is John Klein. And there's this green as, as clays, and they kind of go away after a while, and then they come back as we, as we go up the slope. There's some minerals, you'll see jerosite is color-coded, and jerosite is a mineral that only, jerosite and uh, other minerals only form under, uh, under uh, aqueous conditions. So we're basically showing the influence of water there. And calcium sulfite, you'll see from some of the imaging that I'll show in a minute, we have these calcium sulfate veins all over the place. And sure enough, they're showing up in the mineralogy as well. So what the imaging is showing us is uh, jump to the conclusion here that we concluded really early in the mission, but it's been reinforced as we went along. This really, this crater really had been an ancient lake environment. So uh, it got evacuated by this big impact and then a lake formed. It had to be really a pretty long lasting lake. You can see on the bottom left, these are lake deposits, basically sediments that uh, accumulate on the bottom of this lake uh, as material falls in. And then the folks who study geology basically look at deltas, basically as rivers are flowing into a lake. Uh, that's schematically illustrated on the cartoon. Then it uh, produces these layers of rocks. And the layers of rocks basically can uh, tell us that there were these deltas there. So all this evidence is basically pointing to what was really a long-lived lake environment. And then look at this image. See all these, these kind of whitish calcium sulfate veins? Uh, that's what showed up in the, in the x-ray diffraction images I was showing you. And it's evidence, even after the lake dried out, there was probably subsurface water that got forced up from below. And that subsurface water uh, basically deposited these minerals. And we see them all along the traverse as we've been uh, marching along with, with curiosity, wheeling along with curiosity. So that's kind of a little snapshot of the mineralogy and geology. The MAVEN mission is all about uh, understanding how the atmosphere is escaping from the MAVEN orbiter, how it has escaped over time. And part of the story there is really how fast the light elements escape compared to the heavy elements. And is this a difference in escape rates of light and heavy elements, which we call fractionation, uh, is, that, um, uh, is that telling us something about how the climate changed? Or maybe if we're looking at ice uh, down in the south, is it telling us something about biology? Very interestingly, on, uh, as far as methanogens on Earth go, they really fractionate. They basically like to process the light carbon faster than a heavier carbon. And so there's some biosignatures, potential biosignatures, that one can find uh, even in, in biological systems. But it turns out it's dominated, and here's kind of a graphic illustration of what Maven's telling us, that it's dominated the, the isotopic fractionation by this escape of the atmosphere, basically the solar radiation producing charged particles. They get captured in the magnetic field. They go slam back into the atmosphere. And Mars being a much smaller planet than Earth, uh, basically the gases can escape more readily. There's less gravity to hold them in. And so over billions of years, basically, the atmosphere has fractionated. The uh, argon 36 and 38 that were there originally aren't there in their original ratios. Argon 36 has escaped 
uh, more rapidly over time than, than argon-38, 30, for example. And so the conclusion, you know, basically coming from both MAVEN and from our experiments uh, on the surface of Mars is, you know, this is what it looks like now on the surface, but way back when, let's say, let's say three and a half billion years ago, uh, you know, this is probably what, uh, what the surface uh, in the area that we're at with Gale Crater looked like. Uh, lakes were present and uh, potentially cloud, potentially rain and that type of thing. Uh, how long did these aqueous uh, uh, conditions persist? I talk a little bit about that. And that's really tied into also, now that the atmosphere is way thinner than it was, you know, it's, it's now uh, less than 1% of, of the uh, pressure on Earth. Now that the atmosphere is very thin and cosmic radiation comes slamming uh, into the surface of Mars, uh, what's that doing to these biosignatures uh, that we're looking for? And we can actually measure that. We essentially, as we heat up samples, uh, basically that cosmic radiation per changes a nucleus and it turns uh, oxygen and silica and other kind of heavier elements. And as this radiation, very energetic radiation slams into these elements that are present on the surface, it produces helium-3 and neon-21 that we can measure with our mass spectrometer. And then with all the neutrons flying around, uh, chlorine-35 basically captures a neutron and produces argon-36. Now that's very, very cool from understanding what's going on there. But what's really interesting is if we measure these three gases, uh, they give an age for how long this cosmic radiation has been slamming into the surface, kind of a, a picture of it there. And it turns out they all give the same number for a couple of the first samples that we drilled, 80 million years. You know, why is it 80 million years when the lake was present billions of years ago, much, much longer? And the reason is erosion. The lake dried out, uh, you know, maybe three billion years ago or so. And uh, basically then uh, erosion from winds and so on can move material around. That's why you get dust storms on Mars because there are winds and, and dust lofted into the atmosphere. And so the little samples that we looked at uh, basically had been near the surface for 80 million years. And even though that's short time uh, on the time scale of, of other changes that happen on, on Mars, it's really long enough to do some serious damage to complex organics. I tried to illustrate that there by showing what might be a biosignature there, let's say a juicy thing that you know, might look like DNA or some other molecule that life created. And the radiation might just blast that apart. And so that's one reason that the ExoMars mission is going to try and get below the damage. Uh, it's going to launch in 2020, and we have an instrument on that as well. It's going to get down to uh, a two meters at, at most, and we'll try and pull up potentially biosignatures uh, from very ancient Mars. The only thing we can really do with curiosity is try and look for spots maybe where the erosion, if a scarp was being eroded away, we can kind of go to the edge of that scarp and maybe. Uh, sample materials that are less exposed to this long-term uh, radiation. Kind of another very cool result is from one other isotope, basically uh, argon-40. And argon-40 not, was not in the mix when, when Mars was formed. It's not like that argon-36 and 38, the primordial argon that I talked about. But it comes from decay of potassium-40. So it's a clock. So if we measure both potassium and argon-40, we can get an age that that rock formed, and then it started trapping that, uh, trapping that argon in the rock. And it turned out on the very same sample where we measured the exposure age of 80 million years, we measured a rock age when that rock was formed was 4.2 billion years ago. So that's pretty interesting. There was a lot of volcanic activity going on back then, and potentially you had very hot magma, uh, forming hot enough that no argon would be captured. And then when the rock cooled down a bit, it started capturing its argon until we came along with curiosity and released it 4.2 billion years later. Paul, we do have one more question. Go for it. 
Um, if a biosignature is eventually detected on Mars, is there a way to radiometrically date it as relatively old or new? And if a complex molecule is intact, does that mean it's older than 80 million years? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we would probably date the formation of that organic molecule by trying to understand uh, when that rock was turned into a rock. So what happens is if you have a lake, uh, you can imagine uh, there might, you know, we don't know yet, but there might have been microbes uh, abundant in the lake. And then as they died, what happens on lakes on earth, basically those sediments uh, settle down to the bottom and eventually they get lithified, they form rocks. And so the age of that organic, we probably determine really from finding uh, the age of the rock by exactly the, the technique that, that I mentioned. And uh, so if a complex molecule was formed, potentially if there was current life on Mars and it was a, a, an organism, a microbe that liked to live off the energy in rocks, I mean, it might have been formed yesterday. So I think it could be old or it could be new. But if we're drilling into the interior of the rock, it probably would be the, the rock age that would tell us uh, about the age of, of that microbe that produced the biosignature. There's one really interesting measurement that's really relevant for habitability. And habitability is not just whether you had water, but how long the conditions for life might have persisted. And one of the conditions for life being uh, enough water over a long enough period of time. We dated another rock by basically developing a specialized experiment in, in a mineral that was, we know was formed by liquid water, it was jericite. And we found the age of that rock was only a little bit over 2 billion years old. So that means even though the lake might have formed, uh, you know, closer to 4 billion, and it might have persisted for some millions of years, uh, and then the lake dried out. Some of these calcite sulfate veins that I showed you, that might be water coming up from below, from sub, subsurface water, and maybe it formed this rock. Uh, but that's kind of giving us evidence that aqueous conditions may have persisted for, for really a very long time uh, on the surface of Mars. So I'm getting to methane. I'm on six and methane is, is seven. So let me just give you a quick overview of what we found uh, with organic compounds on Mars, because I, as I told you at the beginning, methane is not the only organic we, we're looking for. We're looking for other organics. And of course, it's complicated because if you have a microbe, you, you have to have enough of them. They have to get preserved, for example, in sediments. They have to get lithified in rocks. And then when they come up to the surface, there are all these radiation processes that can destroy them. So it's a tough life if you're an organic on Mars. You, uh, you have lots of things going against you, but nevertheless, we're looking. These are the types of experiments I talked about. We put a sample in a cup, we heat it up, we got temperature on the bottom, and these are showing some of the gases that come off. For example, water in blue, um, carbon dioxide in black, and oxygen in, in green, and sulfur dioxide in, in red. And all those are telling us something about the, the minerals that are there. For example, this high temperature water that you see up at 750 degrees or so. That's from the clay that the mineralogy experiment detected. The sulfur and the hydrogen sulfide are from decomposition of sulfur containing minerals. The, both the oxygen and the hydrochloric acid, which I didn't plot, are coming from the breakup of perchlorates and so on and so on. NO from nitrates uh, and I already talked about argon, uh, neon, and helium. But then what's interesting from the point of view of organics is this carbon dioxide peak, and we also see carbon monoxide as we heat it up. And that may be some of this oxygen that's being produced in green is basically combusting, basically turning organics uh, into carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. Uh, some other things can give off carbon dioxide, like carbonates, but they're usually at a high temperature. So we think this CO2 and the CO are basically from uh, organics uh, being combusted in our ovens. But nevertheless, we're finding organics that uh, don't get combusted. And 
Again, this is a type of experiment I described, retention times on the right. And, and just take a look at the upper sample instead of going through all of these. In the Cumberland sample, we found these molecules separated out, uh, chloromethane, dichloromethane, trichloromethane, and, and so on, with the most complex of the chlorine-containing compounds being chlorobenzene. And you can see that on the, on the right. Chlorobenzene is just a benzene with a chlorine replacing uh, one of the hydrogens. And that showed up in the Cumberland sample, the second sample we drilled, but not in several of the other samples. So, so that was pretty interesting. Uh, later on in the mission, we found sulfur-containing compounds. And again, the same type of, of chromatography spectra, time on the horizontal axis, signal on, on the vertical asset axis. And what we pulled out of that data was, was thiophene and sulfur-containing molecules. And uh, thiophene, methyl dimethylthiophene, and, and a few other very simple uh, sulfur-containing molecules. And then just from the evolved gas, not from the chromatography itself, we saw signals that are really suggesting that a lot of the carbon that's there might really be what we find on Earth is kind of what we call macromolecular or carrageen-like material uh, from the breakup of that material, kind of has a structure that looks like coal a, a little bit. And end up before we get to methane on what I think is a really, really interesting result. We're, we're submitting a manuscript on this, and this is really a long chain hydrocarbons, basically a decane and dodecane, uh, C10 and C12, and probably C11 in there. Uh, uh, and essentially, uh, those are really interesting because the lipids of cells uh, are fatty acids. Uh, if we heat them up, we may release some of these linear chain uh, alkanes. So no evidence for life, no conclusive evidence for lice, but it's a type of thing, the complex molecules that we're, that we're really looking for. And we have other wet chemistry experiments that we're just getting ready to uh, exercise on Mars that will help pull out those uh, complex uh, uh, fatty acids more readily. I won't talk about the details of this, but Nine of our cups basically contain a liquid that'll, that'll help with those uh, chemistries. And so when we publish these results in science, basically the perspective that uh, uh, an astrobiologist, Inga Loss Ten Kate, uh, wrote down there was that uh, the question of whether life may have originated or existed on Mars is more opportune now that we know that organic molecules were present on its surface. So the message is there, They've not all been destroyed, there's, there's still something there. And again, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but with the ExoMars experiment, which we're really hoping will launch next year, and they're working on some, some parachute issues at the moment, uh, we're gonna drill down, and we have an instrument from Goddard uh, that will try and bring up some of the sample and basically look at it with these gas chromatograph mass spectrometer techniques, and then also by laser ablating some of the sample another method of just uh, looking, for, uh, looking for organic compounds. But getting back to methane, I've digressed. So what did we find early in the mission? Uh, we first, there were fairly high air bars on the methane and we didn't see anything above the background. And then all of a sudden, about 300 days into the mission, we, we saw this spike. Uh, so on the horizontal axis, it's just days into the mission on Mars a day is called a sol. And then on the vertical axis is, is the amount of methane in, in parts per billion. And then it decreased a little bit and then it came back uh, a few uh, hundred sols later. And then it persisted for a while, uh, up to seven, eight, uh, almost uh, nine parts per billion. And then it went away again. And so then what we did is we went back and we scratched our heads. So we have a test bed, basically an instrument that is exactly like the instrument on the rover, or as close as we could make it anyway. And we developed basically a procedure where we would scrub out the, the carbon dioxide and just let the methane from the atmosphere get enriched in that tunable laser spectrometer. It was a way of increasing the sensitivity. And when we did that, we found methane every single time we looked. And um, take a look at this plot. Uh, 
it's not up in the 10 parts per billion, everything is below one part per billion here. And we found out that there was a, basically a trend with season. The methane was basically most intense kind of toward the end of, of northern summer, and then it kind of decreased in the winter. And so we have theories that, that might explain that. For example, if there's a little bit of a seep of methane from below the surface, then the temperature of the surface might be able to modulate uh, the methane that's kind of being released from the seep. But the story gets more complicated. I'm getting ready to, to wrap this up here, but a lot of uh, work happening in, in uh, very recently, in, in last year and this year. For one thing, the Europeans have an orbiter called the Trace Gas Orbiter. It got to work and it does this solar occultation experiment where you can see on the right, where you're basically looking at a star or looking at a sun and there's a very long path length and they're looking for methane absorption. They didn't see any methane. And so the, the theory is, uh, well, maybe there's methane, but maybe it's very rapidly destroyed like we had uh, discussed earlier. And maybe if it's coming out of the surface, maybe it's not making its way up to the kind of three or four or five kilometers above the surface where this instrument can sense. And then what also happened is the, Exo, the Mars Express mission went back and took a look at data they'd collected over Gale Crater at about the time we saw one of those spikes. And they also found methane there. They, have a, they were looking right at the surface in this case and found about the same amounts of methane we were seeing with curiosity. And then uh, a surprising thing happened. So we had a, a fellow on the team, John Moores, uh, who works at the University of Toronto. He had predicted that, you know, if there are these low level seeps, maybe methane kind of accumulates just very near the surface and doesn't get mixed until the daylight. And when daylight comes along, what the, uh, what the scientists call this atmospheric boundary layer, then it would get mixed and methane would, would then diminish. And that might explain a few of the observations because most of our observations were happening at night. So we did an experiment to test this. And instead of finding a small increase in methane like uh, John Moores had predicted, uh, we found a huge methane spike, uh, more than we'd ever seen uh, using our enrichment technique up to about 20 parts per billion. We haven't published this yet, but we're getting ready to uh, write it all down and, and submit it to a journal. And so it's really interesting what, what on earth is happening with methane, uh, if it really has a long time in the atmosphere, uh, why is it going away so fast? Is it really coming from a seat below the surface? Uh, you know, is there some contribution from uh, meteoritic infall uh, and that type of thing? And uh, so the mystery persists. We're, we're quite confident in our measurement, although deservedly there are folks who are poking very hard. Did we make the measurements right? Or is it real and so on? But there's starting to be a lot of evidence now from a lot of different types of measurements Methane's there and methane goes away, and it's going away faster than it should. So that's kind of the, the story, the mystery of methane that we're, we're kind of left with uh, at the moment. And so I'll end with this slide. And glad to take any questions if there are, uh, if there are any more questions. There's a question from Jason, I don't know if you can read that on your screen, Paul, or if you want me to read it. Yeah, let me read it here a minute and uh, summarize it. Um, yeah, I just talked about the discrepancies between the trace gas orbiter and the uh, curiosity measurement. And so what a proponent of the, the theory that there's really not much methane there at all ever, uh, is uh, Kevin Zonley, and he was basically asking the very good question, uh, could the methane that we're seeing be coming from the rover itself? You know, is there some buildup in the instrument uh, that would lead to that? Uh, we've, po we've poked at that really hard, and I think like any good scientific uh, controversy, it'll, uh, it'll continue to be discussed, but the SAM team basically has looked at every possible mechanism we can think of. Uh, for example, if it's coming from the rover, then when the rover 
when the inlet to the TLS was pointed into the wind, then you wouldn't expect methane from the rover to be able to go around and get into the inlet. Uh, we've tried to make correlations with, uh, you know, we've looked very carefully at materials on the rover. Uh, could they be emitting methane? And, you know, our uh, belief is, our expectation is that uh, there's really not enough methane sources that would persist uh, on the rover over explain our results. And then again, that low level variation in the, that seasonal variation, I think is trying to tell us something. And, and that's, I think, really hinting that it's really more something that's going on uh, on Mars and really not anything that's coming from, from the rover. I should say that the trace gas orbiter, of course, has kind of just started its uh, work. And, you know, those of us on the Curiosity team would not at all be surprised if if one of these days say, oh yeah, we found methane up at, higher in the atmosphere and, and they reported that. But to date, they have not reported anything except a very, very low upper limit, something like 50 parts per trillion. And I see another question popping up. I hope I answered that one okay. Um, so the really great question, uh, if we had enough methane in our cell, we could get the carbon isotope measurement as well as the abundance measurement. But we don't quite have enough methane to do that. Uh, you know, that would be a good way of really discriminating between any methane that was coming from the rover, for example, or, or terrestrial sources and methane that was coming from Mars, because we kind of expect the methane coming from Mars to have a different isotope ratio. Um, where we do see a lot of methane uh, sometimes is when we heat up a sample and methane is released from our sample into the TLS. And then we found enough methane that we can uh, make that measurement. And we found some, very, some measurements that are way away from terrestrial methane uh, when we've done those measurements. So that's a great question. Uh, and if we see an even bigger kind of spike than we've seen, of course, we'll be, we'll be looking for the isotope ratios and seeing if there's enough to measure it. So that's all I have, Tom, and I see the, I've, I've spent almost a whole hour here. Well, it was well spent. Uh, any, any final questions for Paul? Um, I did put again here in the chat the URL where you can find this recording. I will process this video and, and put it up there uh, within a couple of days. So if you want to review any of the material, um, Paul's presentation is also available <clears throat> in a PDF and uh, the PowerPoint formats if, if you're interested in, in um, reviewing any of the slides or things like that too. So I have a question for you, Tom. Is it present on the uh, PowerPoint version as well? Yes. Okay. What I didn't show, because we ran out of time, I talked too much, is um, there's a really nice video in there that's showing what we're going to do with the uh, ExoMars mission uh, in terms of drilling and so on and how we put a mass spectrometer together. So I think some of you might find that pretty interesting. Good to know. Well, Paul, I, this was great. Um, I really appreciated hearing your perspective on this issue. I know it's, it's been in the news a lot and you, you, it's nice to hear it from uh, someone from the inside of the, the instruments, both on Maven and Curiosity. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time. You're getting lots of appreciation here in the chat. And um, like I said, I'll have this up online in a couple of days uh, for those of you who want to review that. Otherwise, Everyone have a great evening. Paul, again, thank you. Uh, I know you're in the midst of a, a, a work trip and I appreciate you taking the time there from, from your travels to join us. Yep, great. And thanks everybody for dialing in. Uh, always enjoy talking about this stuff. Stay tuned and we'll have uh, the next presentation. I'll be sending out information about that here over the coming weeks and months. Take care everyone. We'll see you next time.